Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope that you can hear me. I'm Melanie Fallick, and I'm here to welcome you to Making a Life, the conversation number four, with special guests, Christine Behar, Adrian Rodriguez, and Demetrio, oh, I always get his name wrong, <laughs> Bautista Lazo. So, um, this is uh, scheduled to be a one hour talk, um, 45 minutes of conversation um, among Christine, Adrian and Demetrio and I, 15 minutes of questions. And um, as we usually do, we add in a little extra time at the end um, for some more casual questioning and conversation. If you didn't get here early, then you didn't see our slideshow. Um, so we will rerun that at the end. And it has lots of beautiful um, imagery from our books, Mind Making a Life and uh, Christine and Adrian's Journeys in Natural Dying. Um, if you have questions, you should put those in the chat. Ideally, you should um, send them out to ask a question, which in the chat should come up first. And uh, that is actually Sarah of Olikala Jones, who works with A Verb for Keeping Warm with Christine and Adrian. And she will be collecting those questions. And then she will be the person who asks um, the group um, the ones that seem to be the most prevalent. So the first thing we're going to do is step, check in with Demetrio just for a minute, because Demetrio is in Oaxaca, Mexico. And he, while we, our event is happening, he's actually going to dye some yarn for us. So um, is Demetrio here? Do <laughs> you hear me? Him. Yeah. Demetrio, I'm not seeing Demetrio. Ah, there we are. OK. Hi, Demetrio. So um, Demetrio is in Oaxaca in his studio with a beautiful display of natural dyes. Can you please just tell us um, what those natural dyes are and then do the, the quick sort of dunk in one of the dye baths and then we'll send it back to me. <laughs> okay. Um, this is uh, what I have here set up. I have my uh, uh, grinder of, uh, for cochineal and I have the uh, pericone or wild chamomile, uh, Brazil wood. Uh, pecan leaves, anato seeds, indigo, sapote leaves, uh, pecan shells, and uh, lichen, pomegranate, wisache, marigolds, and of course uh, the bugs, cochineal. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take this cochineal to dip into the, the dye pot that I have set up over here. <clears throat> so this is just plain water that I'm gonna put cochineal in it. You know, I have lots of uh, lime juice that I uh, already squeezed. <laughs> and what is the purpose of the lime juice? Uh, this is to change the pH and uh, raise it. And uh, this will give us a beautiful red color. Okay. Instead of, uh, instead of magenta. Yeah. If anybody doesn't know, cochineal grows on a kind of cactus that grows all over Oaxaca, correct? Yes, Great. It's, it's from a prickly pear cactus. Okay, and that's the same, uh, is that the same one that you make um, mezcal with? No, <laughs> no, that, that's different. Uh, that's, a, that's from agave. Okay. Okay. 
And where does the wool that you're putting in the dye pot come from? This, this wool, it uh, comes from Chichicapan. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, about 45 minutes from uh, Teotitlan. And what kind of sheep are they? They are survival sheep. They, um, they, they're not a specifically a breed, breed. Yeah, they're the ones that survive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we send a, a letter to an expert for, for sheep. Uh -huh. And we say, can you please uh, let us know what kind of uh, breed these are? Because people down here, they just call them sheep. Uh -huh. and, and he answered back and he said, well, people have a right, they're sheep. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they, they're survi survival sheep. Okay. All right. So we're going to step away from you. Um, you're, we've got the yarn in there and then we'll return to you um, a little later and we'll get to see what you, what's brewing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Thank now you. we're going to um, talk to Christine Vehar of A Bird for Keeping Warm. And Christine and um, her partner, uh, Adrian Rodriguez, um, spent a lot of quite a while traveling to different countries, including Mexico, to do research for their book, Journeys in Natural Dying. Um, I'm still, is Christine coming? <laughs> I'm not seeing her. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Hi, Christine. So before we talk about your your travels around the world um, in order to create your new beautiful book, Journeys in Natural Dying, I want to kind of just quickly go back to the beginning. And, and I have an ulterior motive. Um, as you know, and anybody here who's seen my book knows, it's called Making a Life, Working by Hand and Discovering the Life You Were Meant to Live. And I have found that the people I featured in the book, including Christine, very often have found the life they feel they are meant to live by way of their hands. And I think I wrote in the introduction to the book, um, the title of that introduction is keep looking at your hands because I think for so many of us, the answers are there. But for Christine, I wanted you to um, just take us back to your childhood. I know you grew up in Minnesota um, and then one of the most formative experiences that you had was with your grandmother and her friends in Illinois where you would spend one month each summer. So if you can tell us a little bit about that and how that experience influenced you and, and, and your decision to ultimately start Verb. Yeah, so um, uh, I grew up, um, I had a very uh, lively family. Um, so uh, I have a brother with uh, severe cerebral palsy um, who requires still a lot of caretaking. Um, and so my, I was active and running around and my mom thought, what if I went to spend a month with my grandparents? Um, and they lived in Illinois, um, so about eight hours from where I grew up. And so I went for the first time the summer before first grade. Um, and my grandmother was a very prolific um, knitter and uh, sewer and really loved to socialize. Um, and so I had just this phenomenal time with her and her friends um, where they were teaching me how to sew and knit. Um, and so from then on, uh, I can't remember to what year I went, but uh, for many years, I continued to visit my grandmother um, and her friends were like my friends. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like the really happy um, time in my life. Uh, and yeah. yeah. And then, you know, many years later, you opened a verb for keeping warm and until this year, it was a gathering place for people interested in textiles, uh, somewhat akin to um, the kitchen tables where you, <laughs> you spent time with your grandmother and her friends um, during those summers. 
But um, in the in between those summers, I know that you went to Mills College and studied art history. You became you went to India to study. You became passionate about textiles, and then through a lot of different ups and downs um, in your professional choices, you ended up deciding to start a verb for keeping warm, which is where you are sitting right now, a retail store, dye garden, dye studio. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the name of the store and, and why you chose it? Yeah, so the name of Herb for Keeping Warm is a fragment of a sentence that comes from a book named Women's Work, um, which is written by Elizabeth Wayland Barber. And uh, that book, um, sorry, hold on here for a moment. Um, in that book, what she does, she was a professor at Pepperdine, she's an archaeologist, and so what her job has been is to look at some of the oldest textile fragments that we have available to us today, um, and to look at who made them, how they were made, what the culture was, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so she went and she had a textile fragment that came from a bog uh, uh, in um, kind of close to Latvia or Estonia. And so she was trying to understand who made this, how was it made? And so part of her work has to do with working with linguists who study uh, dead languages at this point. And so there was a language um, that was in the Proto-Uralic family. Um, so in today's languages, that would be similar to Latvian or Estonian. Um, and in that language, they had a verb for keeping warm and it just kind of struck me because I thought, you know, at one point in our lives, um, we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to clothe ourselves. And a lot of conversations revolved around simply keeping warm or protecting oneself from the elements. And so I wanted a name that was going to um, create conversation. Um, and so where people will kind of maybe stop and pause and be like, huh, a verb for keeping warm. Like, what does that mean? And, you know, funny enough, like I call AT&T or, or whatever it is. And like the person asks, like, what <laughs> is your business? And then, you know, I talk a little about textiles and they typically say, oh, you know, my mom knit or my grandmother crocheted or, or what have you. And so there is like kind of a touching moment. Um, that I get to speak with people about this thing that I feel like brings, um, can bring a lot of uh, joy and groundedness to one's life. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, so when we were talking, um, when I was interviewing you for my book, you told me about some of the questions that um, you wanted a verb for keeping warm to pose to the people um, who visited. And I, I wrote down the ones that we, we put in uh, Making a Life and I can just read them. Or do you feel comfortable just telling us a little bit about those questions that you're hoping, you, you, know, you want people to knit and to spin and to be excited about natural dyeing, but there are sort of bigger issues around this. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I am uh, an introvert um, and could happily spend my days in my studio researching natural dyeing and making. Um, and we, we were in a very small space in Berkeley that was fully rooted just in our natural dyeing studio. Um, and we made a pretty big decision to move our space onto one of the most, um, largest kind of traveled streets in Oakland, Berkeley area, which is San Pablo Avenue. Um, and part of that decision was hoping that we were going to, excuse me. Uh, Are you us? We were going to, I'm so sorry, my computer just gave me the low battery signal. Um, but that we were hoping to create conversations. So, um, Throughout my work with textiles, um, you know, there's a lot of really great things about textiles and there's a lot of abuse around textiles. So whether that's human 
rights issues, um, earth issues. I'm just gonna like dive straight into the center of it here. Um, <laughs> and that uh, those things sit on my mind. Um, and so I, yeah, I want to bring attention to those things. Um, and I want for people to have it somewhere in their mind um, and that your decisions around the clothing that you wear and you purchase um, is all part of a much larger scheme. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, that is definitely something that goes on here. And so, you know, there's also just a lot of different examples in this space of of textiles. So for example, like just even the fact that we have a natural dyeing studio, you know, I didn't think ever, you know, I grew up in suburban Minnesota. And as much as I sat with my grandmother and I sat with her friends and made things, um, you know, we had Joann's, you know, we didn't have like a small local fabric store or something like that. And I never thought about, well, where is that fabric woven? Where is that fabric dyed? How is it dyed? That there were even, even options of different dyes. Um, and it wasn't until I went to India that I started seeing cloth woven. Maybe that sounds very naive or sheltered, um, but where I hadn't, I hadn't seen that and I hadn't thought about that. And as I walked and, um, you know, there would be dye houses that, you know, were open to the street um, that you could see. Um, I just was exposed to thinking more about that and how those types of things impact people and the planet um, and what kinds of alternatives there are and looking at people who are working within alternatives. Right. Um, and that all, you know, are maybe necessary on some level, but um, we do have choices. Um, so yeah, I guess, does that kind yeah, of Yeah, that answer? covers it beautifully. Really mm -hmm. quickly. And that segues right into um, me talking about how we met, which was that I was your editor on your first book, which was you had this behind you. And also I can hold up here is Modern Natural Dying. And, you know, this was your first book trying to introduce people to what um, is a, a way of adding or providing color that is um, sensitive to the environment both the, the land, or not both, there's more land, the air, the people, their lungs, their skin, everything else. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because as your editor, I know that it was, that was quite a journey putting that book together. And I know it was exhausting and hard and, and ultimately fulfilling. Um, but I'm, I, I am wondering, um, what inspired you to write another one? Because Journeys in, in Natural Dying is perhaps even a bigger endeavor and that's sort of, that's what we're here to celebrate today. So I'm just hoping you can give us kind of a quick answer about what inspired you to write that book and, um, and what you're hoping people will get out of it. Yeah, so um, a big part of the process of here at Verb is again, you know, like, uh, it's been a journey um, throughout of where we've wanted to understand more and more about the materials that we work with um, within our own yarn line, the dyes that we work with. Um, and so, you know, that's led us to working with uh, local farmers and people who are growing wool um, and even participating on their farms um, in terms of being there on shearing day, skirting fleece. Um, we've planted cotton, we've weeded cotton. Um, I'm a pretty big believer in experiential learning um, and kind of that empathetic mode of understanding physically in one's body, what does that feel like to be in that position, um, which is typically something that I carry with me when I go forward um, and create work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, Part of that process too um, was looking at looking, you know, at growing dye and what have you. Um, and so, like the modern natural dyer was a place where I really wanted accessibility for natural dyeing. So a lot of that work is in extracts, so very concentrated natural powders that are easy to store. They're small. They you just reconstitute them with water. 
Um, it's something we often use in our studio. Um, but that deep desire of wanting to go further into where do the dyes that we work with come from? Who are growing those dyes? What does it look like for maybe people in those countries such as in Oaxaca? Um, what does the, the, the cochineal farm look like? What does Demetrio's life look like? Um, and there were things I wanted to go deeper into in the modern natural dyer, but for issues of space and time and just even um, skill set, um, there are things that couldn't be included. Um, so this book is a much, much deeper dive into some of the more, um, it's in terms of kind of what we have had uh, prior in the United States, like obscure um, methods um, of working with natural dyes. Um, as well as a much, much more concentrated look at what can you use right outside of your door? And how do you get the largest palette available from right outside your door? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you do have people working with, you know, plants outside, but maybe it's like you get yellow and green. How do we keep pushing that into a wider palette um, and where you work more closely with plants or you work with a group of people and work more closely with plants or you meet other people in your community, such as um, people who prune trees, um, where you can work with them and take those um, trimmed parts of the tree and turn that into dye and then compost them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a much more like local community based um, effort of, of, of working with color and with textiles. Yeah, that's great. And that is a great segue to uh, shift over to Adrian, who is out the back door of Verb right now in the dye garden. So, um, Adrian. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> so there you are in the dye garden with some beautiful marigolds behind you. And I want to start with you going backtracking a little bit as well, because similar to Christine, there were some hints in your childhood that you might end up in a dye garden with marigolds, um, but maybe you didn't realize that for a number of years. So I um, tell me how it is that you had your first vegetable garden at six or seven? What were the circumstances in your family that you started gardening at such a young age? Yeah, so my father uh, is a retired gardener. So he uh, worked uh, mostly in Palm Springs on clients' uh, personal gardens. And so, immediately i mean he started doing that in like the 60s so um when i came along he was already gardening and had a full business doing that and had lots of plants around um and equipment and so i was just surrounded by plants and gardening and taking care of plants um so that really shaped my vision of plants uh, as part of your life. And you even grew cotton in that first garden century. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but uh, my sister worked uh, at a cotton seed company, um, which is fed to cows, dairy cows, because it's really high in fat. Um, so I would go there. Uh, she would kind of take care of me and, and I would hang out with her. And there is these huge mounds of cotton seed and I brought them home and I was like, well, there's seeds. Can, I'm sure they can grow. And so I put them in along with like my bell peppers and melons. And sure enough, it grew and it grew little bowls of cotton. So I had never seen that. Um, and I still don't even know if I made the connection between like clothing and the plant itself. So, uh, you know, I would learn that later. Yeah. And so that was your background, but you ended up um, going to Mills College in uh, Oakland, right? Yes. Um, studying art history. And then you had a few different jobs afterwards. Um, and, you know, we're just kind of searching for the right thing. You worked as a paper an office manager in studio tech in a paper conservatory, I guess you would call it, and a bookstore that specialized in art, architecture, and design. And I think you said you worked at SF MoMA, is that true? 
Right. Yeah. So my last job was at the museum. Right. Yeah. So, but now you're full time at Verb, and one of you are the the sort of a verb, the Verb gardener, <laughs> um, among other I am. responsibilities. And there you are in the Verb garden. So, tell us as the Verb gardener what what some what some of the main things you do are. Right. So. Um... You know, one of our missions is to educate uh, people about the the value um, and just the existence of where uh, color can come from. And so being able to walk them to the backyard and uh, of the store and say, this is the color red and this is the plant matter that gives you red. Um, it's a ancient dye and here it is in real life. And so I can show them physically. And so it develops a, a relationship um, with the textiles and plants and makes that connection for them. Um, and it shows them that it's, it's really accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so the majority of, of our like demonstration dye garden here at verb in Oakland is showcasing what kind of plants you can grow in Oakland that can give you color and um, sometimes cultivating those plants for our own yarn line. Um, and then also helping us, uh, you know, I I've been a liaison as well for uh, local farmers for them to grow uh, dyes for us and then us utilizing them again in our production dye studio for our yarn. So you can see here, I have marigolds from a local organic farm um, in uh, Santa Cruz. And uh, you know, this is an example of yarn that's grown with that dye. And uh, so we, we try to utilize the plants as much as possible. Um, for that, uh, and you can see, you know, they they do produce these really beautiful projects, um, and so yeah, it's it's really about education, accessibility, uh, and growing that value for people. Um, so along this journey, um, you've also developed a, a fascination for mushrooms and dying with mushrooms and, and, a, and an expertise on the subject. So um, can you just tell us how, just really quickly about how you, you got interested in mushrooms, what is interesting about them for you and, and some of the colors that, that we can, that can be achieved. And I know we talked earlier in the week about you having a mushroom there and I'm, we didn't, I didn't double check this morning that you had it, but hopefully you do. There's always mushrooms around. Um, so essentially Christine and I were in Mendocino on a uh, trip and we went into this bookstore and found this amazing uh, out of print, small uh, press book called Mushrooms for Color by Miriam Rice. Um, and it was illustrated by Dorothy Beebe. So uh, they are part of like the Mendocino, they were, uh, she, she's passed away now, but uh, she was part of the Mendocino Art Center there and had uh, a real fascination with mushrooms. And she, she wrote this book and I found it and I had no idea. And Christine was already natural dying with plants. And so it was really fascinating to us to learn that you could get colors from mushrooms and then uh, the following year, there was uh, a class workshop at UC Berkeley uh, Botanical Garden on mushroom dyeing. So we took that and then, and, you know, we really felt very confident to start looking at mushrooms together for dye. Um, and they are very color fast. Um, so Yes, I do have mushrooms. I could show you uh, examples. I'm very proud of this book because it is bringing mushroom dyes into um, kind of mainstream media. Um, mushrooms are ex extremely amazing creatures. You know, they're not a plant or an animal. They're in their own kingdom. And in the Modern Natural Dyer, there's a whole section on mushroom dyeing. Um, and I included a shade card here. 
Um, and there's also pictures and how to find them. Um, and so I'll show you uh, two different mushrooms that are uh, very easily found um, pretty much all over the country, if not the world. Um, but this is a uh, Pyzolithus. This is a, a mushroom that grows uh, generally around trees. Uh, they actually inoculate uh, potting soil with it because it's a uh, helps with um, a mycorrhizae like symbiotic relationship with plants. It, it extracts nutrients um, and it makes it available for plants. So they, they include it a lot. And so the colorways I have uh, here, you could see different shades of brown. And this is on wool. And in the book, it's all, uh, I, we did them on three shades of lopi. Um, and so you get this really amazing chocolate uh, brown from that. And then real quick, uh, this was, uh, I went to the Berkeley Bowl and this is an edible, but uh, it also grows um, many different places, but this is a lobster mushroom. And this is also showcased in the book um, and the colors that you can get and you're using the skin so you just like peel off the skin and uh, you can get an amazing range of warm pinks. Um, and I think the really great thing about uh, the, the book is that it's showcasing you how to create a large spectrum of color just by shifting pH um, and adding iron, et cetera. So yeah, those are two mushrooms. And then we have this beautiful hat. This is using another mushroom uh, called Cordinarius. And so this is one of the projects in the book. This is called the basalt knit hat. And so you can see there's two uh, places where you can make small samples of yarn and utilize them as a design motif. Um, and I have them dried here. They're really, really tiny and they're red and they're very cute. But yeah, I don't wow. know. That's they're very that's small. <laughs> so yeah, that's... That some of the colors that you get are by varying the pH. And um, if I'm correct, that's something you started exploring after you were in Oaxaca with Demetrio, is that true? No, actually, we've been utilizing um, pH shifts um, from the very beginning. Right. However, uh, with this book, you know, Christine's first book, The Modern Natural Dyer, was really uh, a foundation for dyeing and didn't go too deep on all of the more obscure uh ways of dyeing or expanding that. So in this book, we really chose to utilize uh, every kind of trick in the book to expand that, um, that spectrum of color. And what we saw again and again is that uh, the countries we did visit, they were also utilizing that technique. So it really just brought us uh, to reinforce our use of pH to shift. And so but it was also really great to see Demetrio in Oaxaca utilizing those pH shifts as well. So it, it, it's definitely like a bond right. that natural dyers share is like these different techniques. All right, thank you. And so now let's go to Demetrio. Um, I'm hoping that I can see him in a minute. Can you hear me, Demetrio? Ah, I can hear you. There okay. we are. Okay. Are you ready to show us what's happening with that cochineal Oh my gosh. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So what is happening here, you know, we add the lime juice. So we're getting a beautiful, uh, um, how say red color. This is not the end of it. It's gonna be here for, a, uh, I would say um, like 15 more minutes. But look, it's already looks great. That's amazing. That is so beautiful. And um, all, uh, I'll say, from the butts. Yeah. Cochineal butts. So cochineal goes back really, really far in Oaxacan history, doesn't it? In Mexican history. Yes, it does. Well, let's 
let's say about 300 uh, BC, mm -hmm. you know, people were using cochineal here in Oaxaca. And when uh, the Spanish uh, came here, they were amazed, you know, by seeing the uh, red colors and purples uh, at the customs of the people on this side. Mm -hmm. So about five years later, they took a sample to Europe. Mm -hmm. And the master dyer uh, tested and called it a perfect red. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, in Oaxaca, it's, it's been very important. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I actually, yeah. um, I, if we can trust Wikipedia, I just looked up something this morning and it said that during the colonial period, it was the second most important or most valued export after silver. It, exactly. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, we didn't have any mines or, or, or um, f uh, factories uh, mm -hmm. in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. So cochineal was uh, 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 something that people can produce and sell. Right. You know, when you come to Oaxaca, you will see most of the buildings in, in downtown. Uh, 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 it was built with cochineal economy. Wow. So I am... Um... I spent a little bit of time in Oaxaca when I was researching my book and I was so struck by the long history of so many of the people there. There's so many indigenous cultures in Oaxaca and you know, you're know you talking about um, cochineal, the dye that you're using here today going back so far. And I think in the United States, um, many of us kind of feel like tumbleweed, you know, we've come to this country, you know, our families came here, you know, maybe a few hundred years ago. Obviously there were people here before that, but a lot of Americans can only trace their history back in this country a few hundred years. How far back can you trace, or do you have any idea how far back your history of your family goes in Oaxaca? Well, um, the Zapotec were established in uh, this, how uh, say Teotitlan, 300 BC. Okay. That, that's as far as I... Uh, that's as far as you can go? Yeah, and so I find, you know, I found when I was in Oaxaca, just so fascinated by the, the psychology of that rootedness and the pride in the culture and the pride in the traditions. And even weaving goes back many, many, many generations. And I, yes. like how many, even today, like how many weavers are there in Oaxaca? Do you have any idea? <laughs> you know, uh, it depends what, we're what kind of weaving we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Just uh, the loom, the kind of looms that we use. I'll show you here. Um, this kind of looms, uh, <laughs> they're probably in this town, probably around a, uh, 2,000 weavers, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a lot of weavers. And besides, you know, we're talking in Oaxaca, there, there's different uh, kinds of looms. There's backstrap looms mm -hmm. and uh, uh, what do you call that? Like an upright loom that comes from the amigues. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's so many weavers that, over here. Right, and I understand that you told me that you, you know, you grew up, you know, among looms, you know, as a toddler, you were crawling around with, with looms and that, um, you know, you were excited to get on a loom, but you had to wait for somebody who, somebody in your family who was using the looms um, to, uh, to die or to leave. And I think you, you said your father had a weaving business and worked really, really hard, you know, early morning till late at night. Um, so how many, when you were growing up, how many looms were in your sort of family's home's studio space? You know, uh, when my father started uh, the business or his own business, I mean, he used to weave for somebody. And in 1972s, when the eclipse uh, happened in Huacuapan uh, de Leon, that was the first time he tried to take some uh, ponchos to sell at that place. And he, he did so well that he decided to make his uh, little workshop. Mm -hmm. And they were building looms little by little. 
inviting members of the family. And suddenly we had about, let's say 15 or 18 looms at the house. Right, and that's- and it, was so, it was so beautiful, uh, sorry. Yeah. Because I, I was, uh, you know, getting a little bit from each weaver, but I couldn't uh, be on a loom because they say that, you know, it, it was a job and they, they have to work. Right, but then, when you were, I, I don't remember how old you told me, I, my guess was it was late teens, early 20s, but you decided that you wanted to try to make your way to the US because it seemed like there were all these good things like radios and tennis sneakers. <laughs> well, you know, as, as a kid, you see uh, a lot of people moving north and they bring back things that you, they, they weren't available here and you know you wanted to know you know other places and plus uh, you know I was weaving by necessity it wasn't fun because I was not making it for art right so I hate it and I decide to move to Tijuana actually uh, the, the, the goal was to be in the states and working at the fields mm -hmm just to bring, you know, those uh, things that people usually brings, clothes and radios and tennis shoes. <laughs> right. So then tell we me- we only use samples uh, by that time. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't make it to the US and you decided to go back to your, to Oaxaca. And, and then you started to reconsider weaving and then began the natural dyeing. Can you just tell us quickly a little bit about that transition and, and, and how you feel about that choice that you made? Well, I realized that uh, be, being in Oaxaca, it was actually the best place to be. So I, I turned back and I told my father, okay, let's start making rugs but now let's do it the right way. What was the right way? Okay, because uh, he used to weave so much, but the weavers were in a uh, high quality. So I decided to introduce, um, how say a little better quality in the weaving and also um, talking to the people in Chichicapan to uh, just being a little bit finer for us. Mm -hmm. So everything was different. And my father, you know, he was used to uh, a tradition of weaving and changing it. And also uh, taking all the little uh, impurities in the wall. So uh, that was for him like too much work. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, no, that's not the way. Let's just make the rugs and sells them. Yeah, everybody does that here. And also, you know, it, I was learning so much from him, although he was using uh, aniline dyes. And I learned so much from my mom, people who, uh, how to say, uh, mixing or, or, or making all the colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I seem to recall um, that one of your jobs when you were very young was going up into the mountains and collecting firewood for the, so that your mom could use it for heating the dye bath. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then the, the dyes that you use today, the natural dyes, are those all collected sort of near where you live? Uh, everything is from Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. uh, grows around, around this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cochineal, you know, uh, lichens, wisache, indigo, from the Isthmus coast, but still Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud. When I started using natural dyes, I didn't realize that, you know, it, it was a big, uh, I'll say, um, what do you call that? Like, you know, people who were growing it or try to grow it. Uh, they they didn't have a lot of uh, where to sell their their product. 
And I thought, wow, I could help them. And uh, I talked to Ingeniero del Rio from a, a cochineal farm in Tlapano Chisli. And I started using it. You know, of course, with a lot of mistakes because I didn't know anything. Because my father, they were only were using uh, synthetic dyes. Mm -hmm. And that was another trouble because, you know, our business was okay. We were selling fine, wholesaling uh, in the United States, different dealers. And so the, the transition was a little bit hard because uh, the dealers, they, you know, they used to buy uh not like a really good quality um into the uh, rugs and they were paying less money of course and they were saying that if you ch switch to natural dyes it's more work uh and nobody will pay because th they don't understand mm -hmm. you know what's the work involved in it right but but you found that you've been able to sort of build this business around what you love and that people are willing to to invest in in the higher quality. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about the the what you're weaving right now? Just we're running a little bit late so quickly, but um, I feel like we're this is, seeing your loom there. <laughs> this is a very uh, old traditional pattern um, that we uh, have in the runs here in Teotitlan del Valle. It's a, we call it a, a caracol snail. So this is the way I, I spend my day over here. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> it's okay. And so is so the a, a snail? Um, well, that's the... Uh, See the curve? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can tell it. Can you? So this curve, this is what they called the snail. Mm -hmm. But and also, that, yeah, that's all, all brown pans. Is are there any? How many different colors are there? And are there any dyed fibers, or are those all the natural colors? Um, these are all natural shades of wool from Chichicapan. Beautiful. This rug's gonna be spectacular when it's gonna be done. <laughs> yeah. So I, love um, I think uh, let's to sort of go back to Christine at Verb. Um, people should know that um, as of this week, uh, Verb is selling some of your rugs, and I believe they might have sold out of the ones that you've sent so far. But I think they're taking orders. Um, but let's go back to thank you, Demetrio, and let's go back to Christine oh, okay. and. Talk a little Don't bit. Sell all. <laughs> I have more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have more. Okay. Good. That's yeah. <laughs> all right. So Christine. Um by Demetrio. <laughs> so um I know there's a bunch of rugs behind you. Um and uh so We've sort of taken this journey today, getting to know each one of you. We've heard a little bit about your book. We've certainly heard about Demetrio in Oaxaca, but you also traveled to Iceland, Japan, and Indonesia. But what I think is really fascinating is that you did all of that, and then you wrote a book that is really about, you know, dyeing being accessible to the home dyer wherever you are and sort of taking what you learned and applying that to what is available right around you. And um, one of the easiest things to access, I know, is onion skins. And um, you have a project in the book with onion skins. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, a lot of times Melanie and I talk about um, like what is something that's really accessible for people, you know, cause natural dyeing can be quite involved. It's uh, sometimes I think about like baking bread, um, you know, like the journeys in natural dyeing, I think of as kind of like the sourdough bread baking book of the cookbook world. Um, so, you know, how to get just someone off and running. And so there is a project in the book um, where you apply soy milk 
And then you put onion skins uh, on the fabric and you roll it and you put it in a pot of water and you print with onion skins onto the fabric. And so, so is this the roll my, of the soy milk? Hmm? The roll of the was, soy milk on the fabric, just so people know. Yeah, so these are soybeans. And in the book, it teaches you how to create your own soy milk. Um, in a pinch, you could also buy soy milk at the grocery. Um, but the soy milk ad, acts as a binder. So when you apply that to the fabric, the onion skin is actually that color and that print is attaching to the soy milk. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get the prints on the fabric. Great. And I'm trying to remember, what are some of the other dyes that you, um, oh yeah, there's our onion skin. What are some of the other dyes that are <laughs> accessible to a lot of people, like avocado pits and what are some of the others that you used in the book that um, a lot of people can access? Yeah, so one of our big um, points of research um, was with our friend Bu Dalmini in Indonesia, um, where she uses her local barks to create quite saturated colors hmm. on uh, cellulose-based fibers. Um, so this is acorns. Uh, and this is acorns that um, where the fabric has been dyed with acorns and then dipped into iron. So another big role that you know we try to fulfill are cr creating pretty bold, punchy colors with natural dyes, um, and as color fast as possible. Um, so you know here's um, pecan holes, and uh, pecan holes dipped into iron. So you know you can go to the grocery as well to get your pecan holes. You know just get the whole pecan and eat the pecan inside, which is fantastic. Use your hulls and create a dye from it. Um, here is uh, birch bark. It's kind of this, it's hard to tell here. It's actually kind of a peachy color and then birch bark dipped into iron water. So, you know, this is from the tree out, outside of our, our front door of our house. Um, so anything with a tannin will respond when you dip it with iron into uh, a brown or a black or gray. Yeah. So you and I have talked a lot about, um, you know, the, the idea that people want a really fast result often, and you are just intent on making sure that people understand about color fastness and light fastness and, and have a really positive experience. And sometimes that does take a little bit longer. And um, we were just talking yesterday, I think about, you know, the chemistry involved um, in it. And I, I wanted to make two points about this. One, a lot of us have a little bit more time right now because we can't go out to the movies and out to restaurants as, at all or as much as we used to. And I really feel like this whole idea of something being faster or more convenient is kind of a, a cultural notion that's been fed to us and where many of us are very willing and able and you know willing to say like you know fast food is not ideal it's not the most nourishing um oftentimes the way we eat it is not um as good for our families and our friends <laughs> in terms of our relationships with one another so you know i've just been thinking a lot about your book and the the different techniques in it and What's amazing is that you guys did the chemistry work so that it's really a matter of following the directions. Um, and I, I just wanted to take this chance to kind of invite people to let go of the notion that it has to be fast. I mean, there certainly are things you can do quickly and the Onion Project is an example of one that's pretty quick, but um, I'm really excited. I've picked up some uh, black walnuts from the ground um, in my backyard. And I think it's the right name. There's a very invasive plant. I think it's pokeweed and I yeah. believe it makes red. So mm -hmm. I am excited about using an invasive plant, which is good to get that, get rid of that, but then to use it in a way that um, yields such beautiful color. And, you know, it's so amazing to me, like the, the, it's not even the magic. It's like the natural world has these secrets that people 
used to uncover um, because they relied on that kind of ingenuity to find out what foods were healthy, what, what plants would yield dyes, what, how to make things warm. And, and we've, we've kind of lost that to the point where we look at di natural dyeing as kind of magic, but it's not magic. It's just that the industrial world has sort of convinced us that convenience or chemical dyes are somehow better. So um, we're running a little bit late, but I wanted you to just respond to that um, if you could, and then I wanna switch over to the Q and A, but so go. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's a big, uh, where to even begin. But I mean, I do think that, um, I mean, yeah, uh, there is a magic at hand. And, you know, something I'll say is that, um, you know, Sarah, who's underscore ask a question right now um, on the talk here and who is the production dyer at Verb. Um, you know, she has a degree in chemistry and her partner has a PhD um, essentially in chemistry. I'm going to distill it down to just that. It's obviously much more nuanced than that. Um, but there were times that we would send home questions and ask like, could he weigh in on, you know, a certain aspect of even something as seemingly simple as pH. And there were so many interrelational um, complexities to it that he would even have a hard time giving us a straight answer. Um, and so, you know, there are still so many parts of the natural world that we don't understand um, that uh, it would take someone specializing in a PhD to understand, yet there's no funding for that kind of work. Um, and so, yeah, I just think like, Again, trying to just get as close as possible to what's in front of you. Okay, so everybody, it's two o'clock, which is our official end time, but we're gonna run, we normally do extra 15 minutes. So let's just stay on, do the Q and A, and then we'll finish with the slideshow. And if anybody needs to leave because their plan was to leave it too, we understand. But um, Sarah, do we have lots of great questions coming in? Hello, I have a question for Demetrio, and it is about the indigo that he uses. If he could describe briefly um, what type of, excuse me, what type of indigo he's using. Uh, hi. Well, the kind of indigo we use, it's called indagopera fructifera that uh, we got from the Isthmus coast. The down here, they call it sacatinta. Okay. Is there another question, Sarah? Yes, sorry, I have a little trouble hearing Demetrio. One other question for him would be to describe uh, when he's weaving rugs, does it take a different amount of time depending on the complexity, the size of the rug? Exactly. Kind of it, it is depend on, on the pattern, you know, like this pattern right here, it's more intricate than this one here. And I understand the tree of life is one of the most complex ones that you weave. Is there one of those right above you? Uh, up here, yes. It, it's not the most intricate, but it, it is, uh, I'll say, time consuming because uh, I have done other uh, patterns that are more uh, intricate. Awesome, thank you. I would say then opening to Christine, Adrian, and Demetra, one of the most common questions we're getting is interest in pH with regards to cochineal. And of course, Journeys in Natural Dying does go into this. But if anyone wanted to offer a couple general overview or a couple words of advice, I think people would really love that. And then to know that reading Journeys in Natural Dying and going into the instructions in there is gonna be the best way to learn more about that. Does anyone wanna jump in and say something? Christine, why don't you do it? Okay. Uh, it's hard to know where exactly to begin. Um, so shift in pH change colors um, 
And there's some dyes that are more receptive to shifts in color due to pH than others. So dyes like cochineal and matter, for, existent, for example, um, are, are very sensitive to shifts in pH. And so that shift can occur. You can start shifting the pH in the mordantine process. You can shift the pH in the dyeing process. You can shift the pH after the dyeing process by doing baths. And uh, pH, so, you know, there's seven is neutral and then you've got down to zero is acidic and then, you know, up to 12 is alkaline. And uh, from an acidic point of view, uh, things like protein-based fiber, so like wool, silk, uh, alpaca, uh, they get along fairly well with acidic. So you can apply heat and acid together and not necessarily, silk's a more temperamental, but let's just stick with wool. Uh, they, it, it'll be okay to raise the heat and you won't hurt the fiber. Alkaline, however, when it comes to wool, if you have heat and alkaline, you can damage the wool fiber. So there's these intricacies. So there's going to be an understanding of what type of fiber you're using, what dye you're using, and are you creating an acidic environment or an alkaline environment? And how do you, um, what are the ways in which you can change that? You know, you're saying changing the pH, but you know, what are like, we, like Demetrio used lime juice. That is mm -hmm. one way of doing it. What are some other ways that you can do it? Yeah, so uh, lemon juice, citric acid, tartaric acid. Um, and then on the alkaline side, you know, you've got things like limestone, shell lime, uh, soda ash, um, wood ash. So in the book, there's a recipe how to create alkaline water using wood ash. So you can go and go to your local, you know, um, wood fire pizza restaurant, ask them for ash. Sarah, can you mute? Um, oops. And then create a uh, high pH water using that locally sourced wood ash. You don't have to get a chemical that's being imported from somewhere else. And that high pH water that you create using wood ash, you can use to shift cochineal to purple. You can create your indigo vat using your own grown indigo. So uh, Persicaria tinctoria is the type of plant we focus on in the book to create your own indigo. Um, yeah. And I, I do want to point out that Christine, you had told me that you you specifically chose one of the reasons why you chose Mills College was because they didn't require that you take like a hardcore science class. And I've been thinking a lot about that this week. And if we got to do natural dyeing in chemistry class, I think that I would have been a whole lot more interested in chemistry, because for me, my personal experience was I just couldn't conceive of how what I learned in class applied to my real life. Um, so it's really kind of amazing to listen to you talk about the pH, which sounds like high science to me, but you know, to talk about chemistry um, in this way with such familiarity and and you know, with real appreciation of it. And uh, again, it's a, I think for all of us who are maybe were taught to be or became afraid of math or science, um, that natural dyeing is a way to do it that is great fun. It feels more like play. Totally. And I definitely do want to hear um, Ada and Demetrio, if you guys, if either of you have um, a tip you want to share around pH or any insight that you've experienced. Demetrio, would you like to say something about uh, your experience with pH and any tips or tricks you have for people? <laughs> okay, so like you said before, you know, uh, working with wool, <clears throat> working with, it's a little more complicated to reuse alkaline. Uh, when I start learning about, you know, uh, changing pH with alkaline, I put like one kilo of baking soda in a big type pot. I put a lot of yarn in it, so I just ruined everything. 
So my dad was so mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, over the time, you know, I got the experiences that having a, a different bot and uh, about 70 Celsius using the uh, limestone, it's really good to uh, get Thank you. Thanks, Demetrio. Eddie, did you want to say anything? I think, you know, um, so I think one of the great things about this book and why I like I'm very excited about sharing it with the world is that it has so many shade cards. We made like over 400 shade cards and I can't even tell you how insane and awesome that was. Um, and then to be able to have it in print and for you to refer to it so you could really see how pH works and why you would even care to use it. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the, the cool things about the book. Um, so I will, encourage folks to, to take a look at the shade cards. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, with the lobster mushroom, um, we used, uh, I want to say we used baking soda um, at your mom's house. We were just kind of uh, foraging in northern Minnesota. And I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. Like, uh, these mushrooms are here. And I know for a fact, if you change the pH, we could get a really great pink off of it. And, you know, we looked around her house, we're not at our dye studio. So what do you do? Um, and so what we ended up doing was just getting a little baking soda and shifting the pH. And believe it or not, we got this amazing color. And it was just like, what the? So that was the really cool thing about like, seeing how accessible and available i mean we literally you know and this is an edible this is sold as an edible this is called lobster mushroom um it's hyphaloma fascicular and this uh is actually a parasitic mushroom so uh sometimes you don't want to eat it because you don't know what it parasitized uh sometimes it's a poisonous mushroom but uh yeah, I think the accessibility of being able to just go into your pantry, grab a teaspoon of baking soda or an eighth of a teaspoon, and there you have it. I mean, how cool is that? Or go get some lime juice. You know, uh, it'd be great to, uh, I, I saw that people wanted to check back with Demetrio and see how his yarn is going with, yeah. that, li with that lime juice. So, so maybe we could see if Demetrio could show us the yarn. <laughs> Yes. Also, I want to say Demetrio has a guest house. So uh, this is where he teaches dyeing classes and weeding classes. And so one day when we go places again, maybe. Uh, anyway, it's a really amazing place. Um, and I highly recommend visiting him. <laughs> I, I call it uh, vacations to die for. <laughs> All right, so let's see your yarn, Demetrio. Yeah, can you see it? Wow. Beautiful uh, red. That's beautiful. No, it's amazing. Yeah. So I remember um, you said to me, uh, I think you, or maybe I heard this in an interview, you were talking about how your um, schedule changes throughout the year, Demetrio, depending on, you know, when the, when you can harvest dyes and everything. And I think you, you said that you could die from November, late November till January, and that basically you stop dying when you run out of yarn. And uh, so I, yeah. I hope you have lots of yarn this year so that you can continue dying for a long time. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you to you, Demetrio, to Christine, to Adrian, to Sarah, to Allie and Joan behind the scenes, and to everybody who has come. We're at 2.15 now, so it is time to, um, 
to go um, and say goodbye. We are gonna show a slideshow that, and you'll get to see um, a lot of scenes from the adventures, the journeys that Christine and Adrian took to, to make their book. And, and I, in parting, I would just say, 